gays are not that safe, especially when the police see you or the people of the society. There are places you can't walk because you are afraid of how people will react. As discrimination against homosexuals in Africa reaches a new, murderous peak, we tell the story of one man's determination to protect his family and survive. Homophobic prejudice, fed by a vicious newspaper campaign, set off a wave of anti-gay demonstrations across Africa. High-profile gay activist David Cato spoke out about fears for his life and was later killed in his own home. In Kenya, it is illegal for a man to have sex with another man. The punishment can be up to 14 years in prison. I usually maybe wear makeup. Like today I have to shave and I'll, I'll probably have some powder on my face. You know, sometimes I usually put on earrings, the earrings that you just touch like this. Something just somebody will see and know. When I immediately came to Mombasa, you know, it was easy. It's not like in the village. Mm, being a Friday, people are out for the weekend. Just go to town and hang around with some of my friends. Walk here and there looking for some plants or two. Melvin is a sex worker on the streets of Mombasa. Melvin is also bringing up his eight-year-old sister. He didn't want us to film her for fear of recriminations. My parents died of uh, HIV in the year 2006. I was um, 19 by then, and I had just completed my fourth form. Yeah. And my sister was three years old at that time. So I ended up going to my grandfather's place, but after some time, they too started changing, you know? And they told me I could no longer stay there anymore because I was becoming a burden to them. And I could also not leave my sister with them because nobody was willing to take care of her. So I decided to come with her to Mombasa since life in, in Mombasa is a little easier. Looking after her is not an easy job, especially being alone. She doesn't know when there is no money, so you have to do everything to make sure that food is put on the table. Even if it means going out, you know, looking for clients who can give me money, and then in exchange for sexual favors, I can do that. Yeah, I usually go to Saba Saba. There is a bar there where we usually meet some of our clients. It's too dangerous for gay sex workers to tout for business on the streets openly, except very late at night. Yeah, as for right now, since it is a bit early, I don't want to draw any attention. Perhaps I will go into a club and you know, have some drinks. But as the night wears away, I think I can get a little free. I can come outside and walk in anywhere I like, since there won't be so many people. And uh, I'm sure I'll get some water. If you want female prostitutes, you go on this side. If you want male prostitutes, it's on this side. That was my last try. But homophobia isn't the only serious risk that Melvin faces. You know, some clients do not want to use condoms. They tell you that if uh, we use a condom, I'm going to give you lesser money than I would if we, we didn't use one. So when you consider the problems that you have at home, rent has not been paid, the school fees has not been paid, what and what and what, you just close your eyes and agree to it. It's been 30 years since the AIDS epidemic began. Yet in Kenya, there wasn't a single medical facility for gay people until five years ago. Today still, the sick experience hostility and discrimination you know, in some of these public hospitals, you just can't go and explain that, okay, you slept with a man and he, you, you, now have a, you now have an STI. He'll, he'll start asking you questions. How is it that a, a whole man like you is sleeping with a fellow man? You might not even be treated in the first place. Or even if they treat you, you will have been harassed a lot. Ten years ago, you know, very few people could even talk about HIV due to high levels of stigma and discrimination. We are coming from 
the public health perspective, everybody does need and does have a right to public health, regardless of what we think about them. The threat is to the public as a whole, not just gay men. By humiliating and shunning these men, they pose an even greater risk to public health. 15.2 of all new infections, HIV infections, actually occur among men who have sex with men. 60% of them, of those men who have sex with men, are actually in heterosexual relationships. Meaning pretty much, every year, 10,000 women will get infected with HIV AIDS. And not because it's something that they do, is that their husbands have been screwing around, not with women, <laughs> but with other men. Back on the streets of Mombasa, Melvin and his friend are not working, but they're still at risk. Now there are some of us who are just born, they are a little female and they can't change. You might just be walking on the streets. You are not, you know, you are not prostituting, you are just going about your business. The police, they just arrest you for no reason, saying that you are gay and you are caught for no reason at all. Instead of take, taking you and putting you in the car, then you go, they beat you. If you have any money, they take. If you have a phone, they take. <laughs> and some of them even take you to some of these gardens and just rape you. My name is Alan Mohari. I've worked in the HIV field for the last uh, 10 years. One of the groups that I work with very closely is um, uh, a group of gay men uh, most of them are living with HIV that uh, face quite a lot of challenges in accessing health care. Alan drove to the clinic where he used to work. He was too frightened to get out of the car. It is dangerous uh, to feel. It will be easy, you know, very easy to have a mob build up and then suddenly have uh, uh, a scene on our hands. That is exactly what happened in February 2010, when religious leaders and politicians urged the public to protest. The focus of the hatred was on the only clinic where gay men felt safe to seek treatment. So you can see Welcome Trust. So that's the clinic, the two white buildings. And this is where the mobs had gathered. Um, you know, and the guys were inside. And the one, you know, pushing on the gate. Almost, they almost brought the gate down and, until, um, you know, when the police came and, they st they, they, and started arresting the guys. That's when some of the people, um, uh, you know, left after that. But the mobs, you know, kept on going and coming back. Every time they suspected that there is another gay guy, they would come back and try to get the guys out. So we had to, to uh, ask the guys to go away for, but I had to take some people to Nairobi to a safe house for quite some time. Some voices have spoken out against the discrimination and they've come from within the church. My name is uh, Reverend Michael Kimindo. I am uh, an ordained Anglican priest. For over 20 years, I was seconded to the military as a chaplain. I felt I had a part to play in challenging that discrimination. In the year 2004, uh, I had started uh, an organization called Othership based on uh, uh, the Bible, the reading of John chapter 10, verse 16. There are other sheep which belong to me that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them too. They will listen to me, they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. So as I was asking myself, who are these other sheep? And discovered these are the people who are mainly left out by the church. The importance of men like Reverend Kimindo is paramount. Discrimination has far-reaching consequences for Melvin, but also for his little sister and the future he wishes for her.
it, it goes beyond the one person and it, it, it really goes beyond just uh, healthcare, it goes into the economy, it goes into small companies. And you're talking also about the ability for Kenyans to produce, the ability for Kenyans to be a productive nation. But being poor and gay means Melvin has to struggle just to keep himself and his sister alive. I'm just living one, each day, one day at a time. Are you rich, I think? Um, <laughs> I don't know, I still say. Is it because you don't want to know or are you afraid to have the test? Um, it is because I am afraid to know somehow and uh, I still don't have the strength to to go and test because I'm, I, won't, I, don't want, I don't want even to imagine what how Sally will again have to lose me again after she, has, she lost her parents. I don't want to think about that and I'm, not, I'm just not ready. 